Everybody ready? Ready? Yeah. All right. Listen. It's your weekend show. Quiet, numbskulls. I'm broadcasting. With Bob Bierman. It's great. Welcome to your weekend show. I'm your host, Bob Bierman. So glad you're spending some time with me this Easter weekend. Well, in much of the world, we celebrate Easter this weekend. I know in some of the Eastern Orthodox churches, it's actually next weekend. But but for today, we're going to focus a little bit on Easter for your weekend show. Hard to believe we are entering now our fifth year of doing this program on international shortwave and online and on domestic radio. And I'm so glad for the many people that take time to let me know that you're listening each and every week. This is a labor of love. And I I wonder, I wonder what the future of this program is going to be over the next six months or a year, what direction it may take. For the most part, since its beginning, we've talked about life and this journey we go through together. I've shared from some of my life experience with you. And and I'm so excited about the opportunity that I have each and every week. But there are times that I wonder, what direction should this program truly be taking as we move forward in this this very different time in which we live? We, We go back and we remember how things may have been 10, 20, 30, even 40 and 50 years ago. And I go back and I look at the things today that go on, and I don't think I would have ever imagined... When I started out in my life, that this is the world it would be. Oh, of course, the technology is breathtaking. We have so many things at our disposal. But I sometimes wonder about the the condition of men and how we have dealt with each other. And, And I wonder, with all the knowledge we have, somehow we've lost wisdom and common sense. And that's something we've talked about a lot in in recent weeks. But today I want to talk a little bit about stories of hope and stories of basically triumph over tragedy. A lot of us go through some very difficult things in our life, and we wonder how we'll ever get through. We have some twists and turns in this road called life, and a number of crossroads and a number of forks in the road that from time to time we have to pause and and make a decision on which way to go. In my life, Currently, a lot of exciting things are happening. I'm, I'm feeling good about reconnecting with some of my family that I've been at a distance with for the last um, decade or so. A lot of it happened after my first wife passed away back in 2004. And some of the family from her side, you kind of drift apart. You don't intend on it, but it does happen. And maybe, maybe you've been there and you know what I'm talking about. And this year, I've been spending a lot of time reconnecting with people that I really loved dearly that somehow became distance, that distant over time. This coming weekend, not this weekend, but next weekend, on the 27th of, of this month, I'm going to be in Tacoa, Georgia. I spent a lot of my years of my life in that beautiful little town in northeast Georgia, not far from the South Carolina line and at the edge and foothills of the mountains. That's where I met my first wife, worked extensively, went back and worked for Toccoa Falls College. And there in that community, I have a granddaughter that is getting married on the 27th, and I'm so excited to be attending that wedding. It's been a long time coming, and I'm I'm thrilled to, to be there for that event. So we're looking forward to taking off this week and heading up to Georgia. We'll be up there for... A number of weeks at our place in Georgia and uh, some of the future programs you'll be hearing starting at about a week or two from now will be originating from our little studio in Georgia and we're going to be looking forward to spending a, a good amount of the summer there. One of the things that I plan on doing this summer is really getting back into what is my primary function. I've been a broadcaster all my life and and I still do some but I've also been in full-time ministry since basically 1996. And of late, I haven't been doing as much with ministry. I've been very tied up with a lot of things required in in this world of radio and uh, 
and doing things for like WRMI and some other radio stations along the way. But I'm really feeling really feeling led to spend more time in helping develop churches in this very different time that we live. For those that follow such things, what's been on my mind is how can a church truly impact in a positive way its community? A lot of people look at church as that thing we do for an hour occasionally, once a week, maybe once a month or twice a year. But really, a church is a community of believers that are trying to share a message of hope and good news. I'm going to be visiting a church near Lynchburg, Virginia, between Appomattox and Lynchburg. And this particular church started out not that many years ago with an idea, an idea to develop a very classic school that really engages students in learning things above and beyond what many of the public schools do today. And they started out with this mission to have an elementary school, which then extended into a junior high or middle school, and now they have a high school. And they've got a number of students, and the impact that they are making on those individual lives is astounding. These students can go to any college they want. Their academic levels are that high. And I want to spend some time with that church this summer to learn how they journeyed in building this school, this facility, this building, and along with it, a church. It actually started out as a school first. The church was added later in the process. And both have grown dynamically. And I want to learn how these young people will have an impact in the world as we move forward. And how do we take this concept of building a school and adding a church and making an impact on a community in places where such an education may not be available? There are a lot of bigger towns you can easily find a Christian school or a private school, but there are a lot of communities that are not that big that really don't have that kind of education available. And here in a smaller area in Virginia, they've done just that. And I look at places like a Toccoa, Georgia, or some place like a Seneca, South Carolina, or even a Port St. Lucie, Florida, or a Venice or Englewood, Florida, places that I, I know that I've been to and I have visited. And I'm realizing what a wonderful addition something like this could be. So my wife and I will be doing some travel In July, we'll be in St. Augustine, Florida, and spending some time at a conference there. I'll also be preaching in in St. Augustine, and I'm looking forward to that time as well. And it appears, not yet certain, but I'll be spending a pretty good amount of time over the next year or two hanging around up there in in that beautiful city, that historic city of St. Augustine and uh, Resurrection Anglican Church. And I'll tell you more about that over the weeks ahead. But today I want to share some some stories and some thoughts about hope at this time of Easter. You know, St. Paul is the one that said, without the resurrection, we are the most hopeless of all people. We have nothing to look forward to. There's nothing without the resurrection. And in so many churches today, the idea of the resurrection is being minimized and in some cases even being denied trying to find a humanistic answer to this person named Jesus. And did he really rise from the dead? Did it really happen? And and whenever I, I, I run into a church like that, I have to wonder, then, why are you here? What is your function? What is your purpose in your community? If you don't have that good news about the resurrection, why even talk about this man, Jesus? Because without the resurrection, we have nothing. I spent a lot of my life as a youngster in the church, but I also spent some time, shall we say, challenging the idea of the church. In my my younger years, as I started out in life, church was not that important to me. But as I got older and into my 30s, and the more I got into engineering work in particular, it really dawned on me 
That as we build things from an engineering standpoint, we recognize the idea of design. It just doesn't happen. A broadcast transmitter like the one you're hearing me doesn't just occur in nature. It doesn't just happen. It takes design, and it takes understanding the limitations of the world that we live in to make that design work and even function. And so I'm going to be, I'm I'm thinking in terms of with design, it got to me realizing that there's more to this world than something that just happened. And I started rethinking about that faith I learned in my childhood and began to examine it closely and realize what truth was contained And the more I studied, the more I realized the truth that laid out right in front of me and how many of us take it for granted. I got into ministry when I was in my 40s, went back to school, and I served churches in Florida. I served churches in the Carolinas over the years, and I plan to do even more of that kind of work as the years progress and as my health holds up i'll be 65 this year so you know there are so many things i can do and some things i recognize now that really i can't i don't make commitments for 5 10 or 15 years anymore because 15 years from now i'll be 80 years old so i'm trying to use the time that i have wisely as the years go forward so today i want to share some some thoughts about hope and and also as i think about this time of the year this this time of easter i'm reminded of a little story i once heard when i first got into ministry i went to visit uh, a church and i was giving the message on a christmas eve and this guy said you've heard the story about the guy that that came to church on a christmas eve and he said uh, as he left he said you know i love your church and everything about it but you always seem to sing the same old hymns Um, Either, O come all ye faithful, or Jesus Christ is risen today.
beautiful rendition of that ancient hymn, Jesus Christ is Risen Today by the King's Choir. Just as an aside note, by the way, you are listening to your weekend show, and I'm your host, Bob Bierman, and this is, in many parts of the world, celebrated as the Easter weekend, the culmination of Holy Week. This kind of music is something that I love. I've loved it since I was a child singing in church choirs. And later in life, I've endeavored on a little project called Ancient Word Radio. That's Ancient Word Radio. And I feature on that online radio station a lot of this kind of music and some messages and other favorite Christian music and songs. These are the kind that are hard to find on radio today. And I've noticed that over the last several months, we've made some changes and we've promoted it a little bit through some some organizations, and it's beginning to gain quite an audience in about 46 different nations around the world that are listening to Ancient Word Radio. Now, if you like the traditional, and I mean the very traditional and ancient music of the church, you'll find a lot of that on Ancient Word Radio you can go to ancientwordradio.com, that is ancientwordradio.com, to listen. I also will tell you, if you have an Android phone, I don't have this for an iPhone yet, but if you have an Android phone, and if you go to the Google Play Store and look up Ancient Word Radio, just look for Ancient Word Radio, we have an app so you can listen on your smartphone as well. So if you like that kind of music, why not consider paying a visit to ancientwordradio.com, that is ancientwordradio.com, and take a listen. Hopefully in the next month or so, we will be releasing an app for and for the uh, iPhone as well. That is under development, and it's one of the projects that I have in mind to work on when I'm up in Georgia for a little time during uh, the late part of April, May, and into June, and maybe even into July. We're going to try to get that app developed and out to you as well. We're considering maybe sometime this summer or fall launching an additional audio channel of other favorite Christian music that is hard to find, some of the light contemporary of the 70s and 60s and 80s, and uh, mixed with some of the traditional more Americana sounding hymns. So that's another channel we're we're considering putting together. And these are just things that I try to do to to help in a little way that I can, you know, people in their daily walk in life. Once again, this is your weekend show and I'm your host, Bob Bierman, and this is the Easter weekend. You know, all of us and I've shared my story with you, all of us have gone through some challenges and trials in life. Some of us have even gone through tragedy. Maybe you've had something horrible happen like a terrible accident, injuries, and maybe someone you knew was was killed. I've known people that have gone through the tragedy of of hurricane damage and seen immense damage to their home and such a loss of property, even fires can cause people to take such terrible losses. And you wonder how somebody can recover after something that terrible. I know when my first wife passed away in 2004, it just devastated me in ways I didn't even understand. And it was a problem for years to come until I finally recognized the, the need to, to deal with my, with my own personal grief. But that is what happens oftentimes in life. But, you know, I was thinking the other day, I was thinking about some of the things that we go through in life. And I'm thinking of a dear friend of mine down here in Florida. We met several years ago. He's a little older than I am, retired from being an electrician. He lived in Illinois, he and his wife. And uh, they found a place in uh, Port St. Lucie, Florida, and attended the same church as my wife and I. And we would see them for a good six months every year as they spent some wonderful time in Florida. And he was very active in our church. And he was the kind of a guy that I was telling all the time, you know, you should answer that call you have to ministry. 
and he was just resistant to do it, didn't think he had it in him, though he wanted to, he was a bit hesitant to even consider it. They were down last year, and we had a wonderful time, and then uh, he went back first, and his wife went back about a month or so later uh, up to their home in Illinois. She wanted to spend a little more time, had some activities that she's involved in, and everything was fine, and then suddenly in the late summer, he had a doctor's appointment, and they discovered he was suffering from cancer. And at first, they did surgeries and everything else, and they thought they had everything. And then it came back. And it came back with a bit of a vengeance. And he started the chemotherapy and even additional surgeries. And finally, he came to the point that he realized it's a losing battle. And extending your life a little bit with the pain of chemotherapy, is it really worth it in the surgery and his misery? And he finally ended up in a hospice house. But before he, before he died, he finally was ordained a deacon in his Anglican church up in, in Illinois. And this past weekend, we remembered him at our congregation. He passed away back in the end of March. Actually, at the beginning of April, I'm sorry, the beginning of April. He was ordained on March the 14th, and then he passed away on the 5th of April. And I think about his wife and the number of years they've been married and what it must be like for her now. I've been there. It's not an easy time that when we go through these tragedies and these terrible things in life and we wonder, how are we ever going to get through? How will I ever feel normal again? Time is truly a, a wonderful healer. And those that I know that have faith find it vastly easier. Yes, we all go through what's called the wheel of grief. We have the shock. We have the denial. We have the anger, the gradual acceptance, and then the beginning of the healing process. All of us go through that, and we all fall to the bottom at that point of finally accepting, and then it's the climb back as we try to get our lives back together and put things in perspective. I've lost my grandparents. I've lost my parents. I've lost a spouse, and I've lost a number of good friends, and I'm sure that many of you listening can identify and have been through identically the same thing. So you understand what I am talking about, the devastation that it makes on your life, the impact that it makes. You just don't get up and move on quickly in many cases, and often if you move too quick, you make mistakes. I did that myself. I, I confess I've been down that path. It's part of the process of life. And a lot of people go through tragedies. I'm thinking of a person right now, born way back in the 1800s. He was a Christian individual with a wonderful wife and children, two daughters. And they lived in the Midwest in a big city. And he was very successful, but he was also very involved with his church. He had a very unwavering faith. And it seemed no matter what he did in life, he always just seemed to have this hand of blessing upon everything that he ever did. And he wondered, you know, why me? Why do I have so much good in my life? He decided, because of business, he needed to spend some time in England, quite a number of months, maybe even a year or so. And so his family decided to make the journey from the Midwest all the way to London, England, where he'd be working for quite a while, this once again in the 1800s. So the journey is not like it is today where you get on British Airways and hop on over. Uh, you know, it, you got to take the trains and get yourself to the ports in New York and then take a boat from there to, to England. And he decided to send his wife and daughters ahead of him as he still had a number of things to, to wind up in the States before he could even make such a lengthy journey and and be gone for such a lengthy time. So he sent them on ahead, and he then endeavored to get all the work done that he needed to get done to close up the house and, and all that needed to be accomplished before he could depart and catch up with them within a month or so. Well, the, the daughters and the mother made their way to New York, and from New York they got on the boat, and on the way to England... The boat ran into a terrible fall storm, probably a hurricane or something of that nature. And the, he got a telegram 
several days later, indicating that the boat the boat had sunk and all were lost. He was devastated. But several months later, he decided to continue on to England. And as he got to that place, he had asked the captain where that other boat had had gone down. And the captain told him approximately they'd be on roughly the same course. And he told him what time he expected the boat to be near the area where the other boat had sunk months before. And there he went to the deck of the ship on that day as they approached that area. And he meditated, prayed, cried out in anguish the things we do when we are facing such a reality and such a painful moment. And before the day was done, he sat down and he wrote a poem. In time, the words of this poem made it back to the United States, and a man by the name of Philip Bliss added some a melody for it, and many of us know this as a hymn today. The words were written by Horatio Spafford, the businessman from Chicago, who lost his wife and children at sea Yet in spite of all the challenges, he never lost sight of the faith that he had in his wonderful God. And following his time in business, he dedicated the rest of his life in the service of his Lord in proclaiming the good news of hope. And many remember him because of this hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. When
Every time I hear the lyrics and the melody to that song, the melody written by Philip Bliss and the words by Horatio Spafford, it is well with my soul. What confidence Horatio Spafford had in spite of the tragedies of this life. You know, how do I put it? Life is not always fair. It's not always just. Bad things happen to good people, and good things oftentimes even happen to what we would call bad people. That's just something we have to come to accept in life. I think of losing my wife. I was angry, and it was very upsetting when that diagnosis first came in the middle of 2002. That here, my wife and I had finally gotten to this place in life that we were looking forward to work-wise, ministry-wise. Everything had come together. And now it was all about to be shaken and torn asunder and torn apart. And about two years later, I lost her and had to rebuild. And I spent a lot of time wandering in a desert, to be quite honest, away from the things that I really loved and did best. And it took me a long time to get back on track. Eventually meeting a woman who had also lost her husband. And together we are journeying in life and doing the best we can and also honoring our Lord and and answering his call. And we find happiness and contentment in those things, knowing that the day will come that all Christians throughout the world will be reunited once again. We have that hope of the resurrection, which is what Easter is is all about. Without the hope of the resurrection, we have nothing. Life ends, and what is there? There's that old saying about the atheist who died all dressed up and no place to go. But I really believe there is something about the human spirit. That scientists still to this day, we can try to understand the human body, but there's something about the human spirit we have not yet defined, and there are things that we have yet to be able to explain. And it goes back to this idea of creative design. This world didn't simply happen. And that I'm convinced about beyond any shadow of a reasonable doubt. So a moment ago, by the way, this is your weekend show, and I'm your host, Bob Bierman. And you can find us online at yourweekendshow.com. That is yourweekendshow.com, yourweekendshow.com. Also on Facebook, yeah, we're still using it. Sometimes I wonder, but we're still using it. Look for your weekend show. Make it one word. We're on Facebook to let you know when the new shows are released normally sometime around Thursday, sometimes as late as Friday morning. But as a general rule, the program is released on sometime Thursday afternoon. There may be occasions even earlier, but Thursday is the day for the new programs. And you can find them at yourweekendshow.com, at Spreaker, and also at SoundCloud is where we post the programs and on your local radio station and also on International Short Wave. So take the time to let me know what you think by visiting our website, yourweekendshow.com, or even send us an email or a message via Facebook. We're happy to hear from you whenever you give us, give us the opportunity to let us know what you think. And we have been doing this now going into our fifth year. But as I was saying, we were talking about a ratio of Spafford just a couple of minutes ago. And his unwavering faith, in spite of losing his family in a shipwreck on the way to England, And I told you about that beautiful melody by Philip Bliss. Now, Philip Bliss was a songwriter in the United States. He was also born in the 1800s, and he was born in Pennsylvania, the western part of Pennsylvania. That's where he was raised. His His family wasn't very wealthy, but they were a very happy and content and loving family. His mother gave him all of his education growing up because there really was no school anywhere nearby where he lived. And when he was around maybe 10 years old, he they were in town and he had the opportunity of hearing this lady play a piano and it just fascinated him. Music was something that he had a talent for but never had a way to express it. He really wanted to get into music. But at age 11, it's hard to believe today when you look at some of the kids that are 11 years old today. At age 11, he left home and went to work in a logging camp. 
a sawmill in uh, the western part of Pennsylvania to help his family. And I guess it wasn't all that uncommon for a young guy to be working, and he was kind of the, I guess for a better term, the gopher. You know, he would go for this, go for that, help out any way that he could. By the time he was 13, he was their cook. And as he got a little bit older, and he was a pretty good-sized lad and a very strong one, by the time he got a little bit older, he became a logger and also ran the, you know, the actual saw at the sawmill, which was a dangerous job, but he survived. He eventually got married and started working toward pursuing his lifelong dream of, of learning and studying music. And through a number of twists and turns in the road, he, he did learn a lot about music, and he had a tremendous and wonderful voice. And he made, he made his living in teaching music, going from town to town, He also wrote music that he made some money from, and he eventually ended up in the Chicago area in Illinois for a while, and there he ran across an evangelist by the name of D.L. Moody, Dwight Moody, and he was fascinated by what he heard, and he had been raised in a Christian home, so he was already a believer himself, and so was his wife, and he helped out with the music on occasion. In fact, he could have traveled if he wanted to with Moody when Moody did a couple of years stint in England, but he didn't go. He stayed back home in Pennsylvania doing some other work with evangelists of the day and churches of the day and still writing secular music. He also was known to to write some hymns. Moody had been in England, and he came back to Chicago, and he was getting ready to do some evangelistic work in the Northeast and in, uh, all over the Midwest as well. And he had sent a, a telegram to Philip Bliss to ask if he would join with him on this campaign to to handle the music and the singing. And uh, they decided it would be a wonderful idea to do that. And so they had their young children, they had a one-year-old and a five-year-old, they had their one-year-old and five-year-old stay with with his wife's parents for the next few months while they were going to be traveling with D.L. Moody. And so they decided to take the train from Pennsylvania to Chicago, and it was in January, and they headed off on the train to Chicago. Well, it was a bad winter storm. And the train was just lumbering slowly along, not making a whole lot of progress as there was some snow drifts on the tracks. And the train, as it got near uh, the community of Ashtabula, Ohio, if you know where that is, it's in northeast Ohio, not far from, from Lake Erie. And if anybody knows that part of the world, northeast Ohio, western New York, the Finger Lakes region, lake effect snow and snow squalls, can literally come without a whole lot of prognostication, prediction, or warning. And there they were heading near Ashtabula, Ohio, and they were coming across this this seventy five foot trestle over a over a river. And the trestle gave way. The engine of the train had made it to hard ground, but many of the cars behind fell into that icy, cold river. And, of course, if you think about it, back in the 1800s, all those wooden cars were heated by basically like a Franklin stove to keep warm so you wouldn't freeze. And in the water, these cars caught fire suddenly because of all the hot coal and the kerosene pouring out from kerosene lanterns. And in a matter of moments, these these cars were engulfed in flames. Now, they say that Philip Bliss got out of the car but realized his wife was stuck behind, so he went back into the car to get his wife out. But she was trapped, and he stayed with her, and they both died. In fact, the news reports of the day say that Many of the victims could not even be recognized because they were crushed and even burnt by the fire. 
It was truly devastating. Ironically, the luggage they had was in the car that made it to Chicago. And when they were going through the people's things to get their stuff back to their family, wherever they were, They discovered his notebook, and in this notebook, he had been writing another hymn, another song he was going to to publish. And this is the last known song ever written by Philip Bliss. And whenever I've heard this particular hymn over the years and, and knowing this song, to know even as he and his wife faced death together, in those railroad cars burning in a river near Ashtabula, Ohio, they had a faith, and he had the dedication to stay with her to the end as they came to their Savior together where they could sing of their Redeemer. I will sing of my Redeemer and His wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross he suffered From the curse to set me free Sing, oh sing of my Redeemer With his blood he purchased me rendition of that hymn, I Will Sing of My Redeemer, written by Philip Bliss. I share two stories about two individuals that lost things tragically in their life. In the case of Horatio Spafford, he lost his wife and children in a shipwreck. In the case of Philip Bliss, he came to his untimely end at the age of 38 with his dear wife in a train wreck near Ashtabula, Ohio. 
The thing that's in common with both, both families in particular, they all were people of faith. And they had the hope of the resurrection that is celebrated at this time of the year at Easter. They knew whatever earthly loss they would have, they would ultimately have an eternity, an eternity of bliss, an eternity of happiness, an eternity with their Lord. They could sing of their Redeemer, the one that redeemed them. It was Nietzsche, the the famous atheist of many years ago, that once said, don't even bother to tell me about your Redeemer until you can show me you've been redeemed. Now think about that for a second. For those that say that they're Christians or they go to a church occasionally, is there evidence of the redemption of God in your life? Has your life truly been changed? Do you look at life differently? Knowing Jesus as your Savior does make a huge difference in all that you think and all that you do and all that you care for in this life. Suddenly you realize that life in and of itself is not the most important thing. It's a wonderful gift, yes. A gift that should not be taken for granted this time we have. I've spent a lot of programs in the past several months talking about time and making good use of it because none of us know how many years we have. If you had talked to me back in the year 2001, even before the airplanes hit the Twin Towers in New York, the one crashed in a field and the other into a building in Washington, D.C., and over 3,000 Americans lost their lives that day on September 11th, 2001, I'll admit, I thought that I had and my wife had all the time in the world. After all, I'm not even 50 years of age yet, and and the idea of being 70 or 80 or 90, if I should live that long, seemed like an eternity away. We have all the time in the world, and how often do we waste time because we think we have an endless supply of time, and maybe we don't. I remember the first time I ever faced the shock of losing somebody at a younger age. It occurred shortly after I had graduated high school, and I came back for a small period of time to my little community in upstate New York, and I went to work again at the radio station I had worked at when I was in high school and the summer after high school. I had some time, and I worked for them for a short period of time before before moving on to, shall we say, bigger and better things and ultimately heading south and getting married and beginning my career in radio in a big-time way, I was in a little department store. It's called the Big N in Newark, New York, a small town not far from Lake Ontario, about 35 miles east of Rochester, New York. And they had a little luncheonette counter in there. Not the world's greatest food, but, you know, it was 1974, And I'm in this little luncheonette, getting a little bite to eat. And I ran into somebody I hadn't seen since I had graduated high school a couple of years before. She was actually in the class after uh, the class before me, but I had known her from from chorus of all things. She was a senior when I was a junior. She had graduated before me. Had gone on, I think, to a two-year college, and she was back in town. And she and one of her friends. Uh, we, we ran into each other. She also had been in the chorus. And like I say, I hadn't seen him in over two years, maybe getting on three years by that point, because I didn't see much of her during my senior year of high school. And we chatted for a bit and talked about getting together and, and seeing each other uh, sometime very soon. And about a day later, two days later, I heard that she was dead. And at the age of basically 20 years of age, she died of a heart attack. She didn't realize she had a a problem with her heart. It had gone undetected all these years, and she collapsed and died, never really seeing a full life. Then you read about others who are texting and driving who suddenly have a life-altering or life-ending experience. It can happen to anybody. Our life can be cut short, like we saw in the case of Philip Bliss or in the case of Horatio Spafford's wife and children, the unexpected. And that's why we should always be conscious of the time that we have. My grandmother, 
on my father's side. My wife knows full well the the impact that my grandparents had in my life. They would always teach me to savor each second you have on this earth and make good use of your time. And I never understood that as a child, this concept of making good use of your time. As I've gotten older, it means a lot to me these days, a lot more than I ever expected it to. My grandparents lived to be almost 100 years of age, so God gave them a lot of time on this earth. And as I look over their life and the things that they faced, they faced some tragedies as well, I might tell you. They always had a very positive and optimistic attitude about life. They loved their Lord. They were dedicated to the work of the church in any way that they could. And they were extremely blessed financially and in other ways. But it was not always easy for them. They married. They were born around the turn of the 20th century. They married in around 1920. 21, I'm trying to remember the year now. And my father was the firstborn several years later, followed by his brother Robert and another brother named Alan. And one year, rheumatic fever came through. And my father and his brother, my uncle, and his other younger brother, Alan, all contracted the same life-altering disease, rheumatic fever. It claimed the life of their youngest child, Alan, who was only about three years of age. And no one ever really understood the impact it had on both my father and my uncle, the long-term damage. I guess they didn't understand fully back in those days what can happen, the damage it gives to the heart going forward. I lost my uncle when he was in his 50s, and of course my grandparents had already buried their youngest child many, many years before, and then they had to bury their middle child. My father did outlive my grandparents, but not by that many years, because heart disease traced back to rheumatic fever took him when he was 78. Yet my grandparents, in spite of the loss, in spite of the losses, never had their faith waver in all those years, at least nothing that I could ever see or detect. My grandmother shared with me about the night that my grandfather died. They had gotten up in years, they were well in their 90s, and and they had moved from their house in New York to a wonderful assisted living facility in Maryland, not far from where my sister lived. She was working at John Hopkins University Hospital as a nurse, and she found this wonderful place that they moved. And my grandfather had had some health issues. Like I say, he was well in his 90s. And he was becoming more sleepy, more tired, and needing more care. That's one of the reasons that they moved. And she said he got to the point that he wasn't eating much and he was sleeping a lot and she was spending some time with him. And then one, one evening she, she shares this story that suddenly after laying there for days and barely talking or anything, he suddenly sat up in the bed and he looked with his eyes wide open and she said there was like a radiance on his face as he called out to his younger boy, Alan, and the middle child, Robert, he saw them. In tears, he reached out for them and then quietly passed away. I spent a number of years as a hospice chaplain in Southwest Florida. And I have seen some things that are absolutely life-changing, incredible. The only way to put it. I have seen miracles happen. I have seen people fight death, and I've seen those that just willingly and with contentment entered into the next life. So I look at my life and the gifts that I have, the things that I do. This radio show is just one little thing that I do each and every week. And I look for the direction that this program should take. 
I have the opportunity each week to be on a platform that reaches across the United States, Canada, into the United Kingdom, even into Africa and other locations globally. And I'm trying to find what can I do with this precious gift of airtime to have a greater impact for the mission and ministry of the church. I know part of my summer is going to be spent helping develop churches and also some concepts to really impact communities by building schools in the United States. And and once the model is understood and we pray it through and get God's direction, how do we duplicate this, not just in the United States and Canada, but how about in parts of Europe and, and other places around the world to have that impact? to give a classic Christian education. So, the question is, how do I make the best use of the time that I have in in this life? I've talked about time a lot over the last several months. There's no premonition that I'm going to be short-lived or long-lived. I don't know how many days, months, years, decades that I have. But here's the one thing that I do know. I want to make good use of the time that I have. I want to be found working in the the correct vineyard. We can waste a lot of our time doing things that are not really all that profitable in helping one another. And I've got time ahead of me, and the time that I have, I'm going to be using. As I said before, I'll be spending a lot of time this summer preaching, visiting, producing this radio show, and probably getting into other endeavors to help the work, mission, and ministry of the church. It's what I'm called to do. I would love to hear from you as we continue on our adventure together on your weekend show. Would you take the time to let me know you listen? Maybe go to the website and visit yourweekendshow.com. That is yourweekendshow.com. You can send an email to Bob at your weekend show. We also use Facebook. Simply look for your weekend show. Make it all one word. And a blessed Easter to you. And until next week, may God richly bless you is my prayer.